minus 1 plus BR uh, plus C, all times what? All times T to the, notice, R minus 2 plus 2, R minus 1 plus 1, T to the R. So in this case, the characteristic equation, a little bit different. You need to solve this equal to zero is you know, the characteristic equation for Cauchy other. Second order problem. So then you can naturally ask, okay, so there are three cases. It's distinct real. It's uh, complex. It's repeated root. How does it look different? So, um, complex. If this, if you had a Cauchy other problem and um, you know you ended up with r equals the plus or minus i as your solutions, what you do is you say, okay, so y is equal to x to the it. I'm an idiot. Um, try to give me t to the i. And you go, oh, I don't know what that means. And I, oh, okay, fine, let's make it mean something. So maybe that should be like exponential of the natural log of t to the i. Which would then be like exponential of i of log t. which we know is cosine log t plus i sine log t, but then by the complexification theorem, this is actually a complex solution to this real differential equation. So y is c1 cosine log t plus c2 sine log t. There you go, there's your general real solution to this problem. However, notice for a second, the domain is what? Um, it has like parentheses zero and infinity? Yes. Right. And you could put minus t in place of t and then have it on zero, minus infinity to zero. The thing is, this differential equation actually has a singular point. This is regular singular point. equal to zero. So the domain is not like the domain so we've seen before with power series, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a little different. Um, and so distinct real is easy enough, right? Like that's just C1 T to the R1 plus C2 T to the R2, whatever that is, you know. Uh, repeated root is a trick, uh, but if you have like r equals to 1 twice, so you use like y equals to t, and y equals to t log t. And actually like t to the r, differentiate with respect to r, gives us, you know, the natural log of t times t to the r. So whenever you have a family of solutions parameterized by an algebra variable, if you differentiate with respect to the algebra variable, it will give you a solution which is um, the solution for the repeated root case. This is also true in your already what you already know. Partial partial lambda, e to the lambda t, what's that give you? general trick. Partially differentiate with respect to the characteristic variable brings out the repeated root solution. And uh, if you wanted, if you had a three-peated solution, 
just partial differentiate with the variable again. And that would give you for, for this one it would give you log t squared. For that one it would give you lambda t squared lambda t squared equal t. And you can keep going down this trick and you know generate that fundamental solution set we proved was a fundamental solution set by induction earlier today, I guess. Was that today? I believe so. It was today. Alright, so good. Um, okay, so this is the uh, this is the Cauchy Euler problem. Now, um, there is a couple different ways to go here. I can't remember what I did in the paper. No. Are we missing one case? Does the complex one cover uh, the case where it doesn't have to be complex? Right? I'm sorry, what do you say? I, I was distracting you. Uh, are you saying that the complex case covers the non, like if uh, like your discriminant is above, is, uh, is above zero? Uh, yeah, I mean, this is a real polynomial, so it's either repeated root, or it's got distinct roots, or it's got a, a complex root. So if it's a complex root, you can do it kind of like this. Mm -hmm. If you had, you know, if it was plus two, That just puts a t squared out here. Oh no. Okay. No, but that was my question. Did that cover the? Uh, you know, you have the the the, the one where you use complex, the one where it's repeated, and the one where it's not repeated. Yeah. Okay. So this one covers that one too. Um. Those are the three cases for this quadratic. I mean, that's that's all of it. Okay. And, and every you're covered by both of these is what I'm saying. Though. Oh no, I just haven't written down the other. Oh, okay. That's so yeah, yeah, you're fine. So for example, like t squared y prime prime, I'll just do that one. Okay. So that gives you the equation r times r minus one equal to zero. So r equals to zero. R equals to one. So c one times t to the zero plus c two times t. Otherwise, c one plus c two t. There you go, that's your general solution to this closure of the problem. And it just so happens that this one appears to have an infinite domain. But that's an illusion because the domain of this differential equation cannot include zero. It stops being a differential. I mean, zero is a tricky point here, let's just say that. But, um, so, so I think what this section says essentially is that um, if you have a Cauchy Euler problem over an algebra, you can um, you can still use it. Still solves just the same as the usual way. Uh, well, it's not quite fit, though. Let me see here. So, there's more I can tell you about these. Like, it's interesting to study the operator. One of the, I didn't go this direction in the paper we're looking at right now, but you can rewrite Cauchy Euler problems as a polynomial in a particular operator. So, like, here I'll show you. So, if we have T squared, well, let's assume it's TD, TD, TD squared, acting on um, Y. This is TD, um, T, um, TD, so that's TY prime. But the, the TD on the inside gives you a TY prime. And then that gives you a T times you know, y prime plus ty prime prime. 
which gives us t y prime plus t squared y prime prime, which gives us td plus t squared d squared acting on y. So since this holds for all y, we have the following. We have that td squared is equal to t squared d squared um, plus t d. Or if you prefer, t squared d squared is equal to t d squared minus t d. So when you're working with multiplication by t and the differentiation operator, it doesn't work quite as simple as what we're more familiar with so far today. You know, like polynomials just in the derivative operator, not in t times the derivative operator. And, um, yeah. Let's see here. So, let me take us through the, through the, so we have at squared d squared, right? Plus b td plus c acting on y equals to zero was the problem we had up there, right? So to this little identity here, what do you got? You got um, a times td squared mm -hmm. minus td. Right. Close parentheses plus BTD plus C, right? Mm -hmm. Alright, no more I think why. Or if you like, this is A T squared plus um, B minus A T plus C acting on Y equal to zero. Where T is T D squared? Is T D. Yeah. Now once you express your polynomial in terms of your operator in terms of just the polynomial of just one operator, any operator commutes with itself. So that you could factor. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So in principle you can factor this into like you know, a times t minus r1 times t minus r2, something like that, you know? And then you can go back to your usual, well, what does it look like? What does the solution of t minus r1 look like, you know? What is t minus r acting on y? How do you solve that, you know? Well, that's t times dy dt minus ry equals to zero. How do you solve that? Uh, it's uh, just integrate back now, zero. Could you integrate back to that? Hmm. You should, you're right, it's, you could, not a bad idea. Uh, so here p is equal to minus r, right? Yeah. So we should multiply by minus rt, is it? Or if p is equal to minus r, then the integrating factor it's exponential of the integral of minus r dt. So it should be, oh, e to the minus rt rather, right? That's the integrator. Yeah. So t, e to the minus rt, dy dt, minus r, e to the minus rt, y equal to zero, which is d dt of what? d dt of, um, t, e to the minus rt, why? That feels wrong. Oh, the reason it feels wrong is there's a T up front. <laughs> yeah, that, I can't just ignore that. <laughs> Oops. My bad. But I do think we can set the variables. Oh yeah, for sure. So RT on the top side. Yeah, we got the y dt, t plus r y, right? Yeah. So dy over y equals rt dt, right? Yeah. 
integrate, integrate, natural log f by y equals, how did I get the, So that should have been R log T. Oh, oh you multiplied. Oh, yeah, I mean, you can just show you. I did the algebra wrong before. But, um, R Y equals to. So that gives us like absolute value of Y, you know, plus a constant, right? Absolute value of Y is equal to like e to the constant, e to the R log. D over Y. So this is. So, yeah, I mean, you can. So, you, you can play these games and go down this path as well, but, um, path is then you can start thinking about the annihilator method for the kosher other problem. You know, how to solve kosher other problems with um, forcing functions that appear as homogeneous solutions mm -hmm. in like general annihilator method for this problem. But uh, so what I'm looking at in this section is actually just like this, right? A n zeta to the n, um, you know, eta to the nth derivative, a2 zeta squared, Eta prime prime plus a one zeta a one z zeta rather a prime plus a zero a equal to zero right so this is the push Euler problem um, and and for the sake of common human decency a n is a unit from the algebra you know let's keep it simple. So, oh, if you, you know, let eta equal to z to the alpha, right, mm -hmm. then eta prime is alpha z to the alpha minus 1, eta prime prime, alpha alpha minus 1, z to the alpha minus 2, and so forth. And, um, And so when you plug these in to the given differential equation, just like in the real case, you get this equation in the coefficients times your, you know, which is polynomial in your um, characteristic variable, which here I'm using alpha for. So you get, you know, a n alpha times alpha minus 1 all the way down to alpha minus n. Um, plus da 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 plus you know a two alpha times alpha minus one plus a one alpha plus a zero equal to um, all of that times um, you know z to the alpha equal to zero. So um, and then of course if you can solve that equation. then you're off to the races, right? That's solutions to that give you solutions to the corresponding problem.
Now, the first question to ask here is what does c to the alpha mean exactly? E to the alpha? Um, would it not be just an arbitrary constant, of, not constant, arbitrary variable? Well, with some power? But, I mean, what, was, what, did, what did t to the i mean, for example, I showed you a couple minutes ago? Um, yeah. Um, you did a thing where it was. <laughs> you did a thing, right. So the, 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 there again, the thing, a certain thingy, according to people Yeah. Matthew. Um, yeah, he made it equal uh, uh, exponential. Yeah, yeah, the exponential, which uh, went into the polar form. Right, so we're actually going to make the definition exponential of alpha times the log of z. So this is, this is only going to be good for z, an element of the log domain of the algebra. So in Nathan's second paper <laughs> on logarithms over an algebra, he defines the logarithmic domain of the algebra. It's the, it's the image of the exponential in the algebra. Um, so in the real case, Well, excuse, see, but that's, that still doesn't do it justice. In the, see, but, well, which algebra are we talking about here, right? Let's see here. So proposition 7.2, um, I don't know if I actually, do I have proof of proposition 7.2 or did I just claim it? I just claim it. Yeah, that's not proof. I think there are probably Alright, so I'm this is a lovely calculation if you can solve the polynomial, right? But for an arbitrary Cauchy Euler problem over an algebra, um, you know, it could be kind of uncertain as to whether or not we have a factorization that exists or, you know, what about the... <sighs> See, in the case of the real quadratic problem we started with, you end up with a real quadratic polynomial, right? Mm -hmm. So we know that if you extend to the complex numbers, it has solutions. Um, but you got to understand here, if these coefficients are from the algebra, we've got an nth order polynomial equation in the algebra, right? Where can we be certain that there's a solution to that problem? Well, it's complex. We could, we could use, we could try to mimic the stupid solution here again. We could look at the characteristic extension algebra of the, of the problem here. And then perhaps from that we can Well, so what I see in this section right now is like if the solution to this problem has a certain form, then I can say this about the solution, right? It doesn't look like I've actually tried to address the question of how to like solve this in general. Um, I don't 
see myself making claims about the general solution set here. I haven't given any examples. And um, I mean, there might be a lot more to do here. So one of the things before I, before I forget, there is a standard technique, trick if you will, to convert a Cauchy Euler problem to a corresponding um, constant coefficient problem. Substitution z equals e to the zeta. So I say you have to let. log of z. It's not it's not a simple transference, okay? Like it's it's a little bit messy. So you have you start with Zn, you know, um, w to the n. Uh, a1 z prime uh, z a1 z w prime plus a naught um, w so let's see here so if we differentiate this with respect to z what happens says is that z dw dz right is equal to eta prime of log of z
So like this term just becomes eta prime. But when you do this, when you differentiate this again, you have you face the product rule, and I say you end up with like one over z squared eta prime prime minus eta prime. Of zeta. And, and I have of zeta here, of zeta. Where zeta is log of z, I think. So then this, this tells you that like, see this gives you z squared w prime prime is like eta prime prime minus eta prime at zeta. So you can convert these kind of terms to those kind of terms. And you basically play this game. Eventually you get coefficients so that you're like beta, eta, the nth derivative of beta. showing the specific trend, like how the substitution make, is made. Yeah. And um, so if you make that substitution, the quadrature of the problem in W and Z transfers over to a constant coefficient problem in eta and zeta where w and z and eta and zeta are related by these equations. z is e to the zeta, and w is equal to n log z, eta log z. So it's, it's, it's a kind of nefarious thing. It's a substitution not just of the independent. It's like it's both dependent and independent variables can be messed with. Um, anyway, there it is. And so what that means, of course, then, what does that mean? That means, in principle, you make that you can make the transference, right? Do the do this equation normal. You, that we can solve that. We'll find a fundamental solution set by the stupid the stupid solution. Yeah. And then, then um, we can we can we can take that solution and evaluate it log z, and that gives us a solution back here. It will be nasty, but yeah. Good. And I think to be fussy, this problem actually is not um, technically under the province of my existence and uniqueness um, theorem because, well, unless we're, I guess if we're away from, if we're away from z equal to zero, there exists, I mean, I think I can do existence and uniqueness. It's just at zero, the theorem fails, like the condition fails. Zero is a singular point here, so I think I can at best hope for a local, a local solution away from zero. But if that point is in the domain of the log, then then I can define z to be alpha reasonably, and in so doing, I can transfer over to the the corresponding constant coefficient problem, apply the stupid solution, and then map back, and I can have a solution that has. Um, I'm not sure that actually proves that it's the general. I guess it does prove it's a general solution, as long as I'm not at zero. Um, let's see here. Do I actually work one out? Sample 7.3. Now this 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 is this is. I mean, okay, fine. It's, it's just not very exciting because this is a Cauchy-Euler problem whose characteristic equation is a real polynomial. Okay, so it's got, but it is the repeated root case. So I guess that's interesting. So, oh, I 
engineered, I've engineered it so that the corresponding eta equation is the repeated group case. That actually is kind of interesting. And then if we use the eta log z, we end up with c1 over z plus c2 log z over z. Oh, and that example is good for arbitrary algebra. That's kind of cool. The thing is, what log means in different algebras is quite different. Because the exponential of different algebras is quite, quite distinct. The log is always the inverse to the exponential. But what that looks like... Could be vastly different. Yeah, right. Now this example 7.4... Um, I have by brute force so I guess I, I again <laughs> I'm always I don't know why I'm so I, I've gained a particular affinity for trying to use this substitution to do these problems I don't think that's inter inter entirely necessary like I think we could solve 7.4 by direct, um, direct calculation, uh, but it would look it would look different. Hmm. Interesting. So I engineered this one, so the corresponding constant coefficient problem is eta prime prime minus one quarter eta, equation 127, which of course gives us characteristic, you know, plus or minus a half. And so those, those would be naturally interpreted as like the square root or the reciprocals of the square root, you know. Which I calculated. <laughs> huh. Let's try this one out here. So we have z squared. W prime prime, right? Plus z w prime minus one fourth. So if we just straight look for a solution of the form w equals x to the r, or rather z to the uh, say alpha, right? Then we get what? We get alpha times alpha minus 1 um, plus alpha minus 1 fourth z to the alpha equal to 0, right? So we got to solve this equation. We had to solve the equation alpha squared. Oh, weird. I mean, no, it's not weird. I just, I'm weird. Uh, minus one fourth. Minus one fourth. Well, that's not bad. So alpha is equal to one half and a half. Yeah, plus or minus one or two. Well, all right, fine. I guess the, uh, the, the main thing here, these are fundamental solutions, right? The, the main thing here is what, what, what is meant by that, you know? Yeah. So I, 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 can, I can show you a little bit more about the technology involved here. So here's the thing. We're in the hyperbolic numbers, right? Yeah. So e to the e to the z is cosh. Z plus J cinch C. 
Holy Minute. Excuse me, Kosh Z plus Sinj Z. Um, okay. Uh, more to the point, e to the x plus jy is e to the x Kosh y plus j e to the x Sinj y. So to find the inverse to this, right? To find the inverse to this, I basically need to solve this equal to u plus jv. You need to solve for x and y. Because that's what it is to solve for the inverse function, is to solve for the independent variables in terms of the quote unquote dependent variables that we talked about. Well, you did pull out of e to the x. Right? Well, yeah, I can look at it as two. I mean, fair enough, I have e to the x cosh y equals to u, and e to the x cinch y equals to v. That's from the real and the imaginary components. And you're right. There's an, So, oh, wait, we divide these, right? Yeah, so, so tanch y is v over u. So y is inverse hyperbolic tangent of v over u. And let's see here, how about this? e to the 2x cosh squared x minus uh, cosh squared y minus cinch squared y is u squared minus v squared. So what I'm doing is I'm squaring this and squaring that and taking their difference, factoring out the e to the x squared is e to the 2x. Yeah. So like, thing is this is straight up 1. Yeah. So this gives me that um, 2x is equal to the natural log of u squared minus v squared, or x is equal to the natural log of the square root of u squared minus v squared. Square root. Divide by 2. Half into a natural log give me a square root. Okay. So, yeah, there it is. Uh, the log of um, u plus jv is equal to the natural log of the square root of u squared minus v squared plus j times the inverse hyperbolic tangent of their quotient. So then, if I want to calculate z to the one half, z to the one half. See what I got to do. Oh, z to the one half is exponential of one half. The log of you know x plus jy, right, which is the exponential, one half, the log of the square root of x squared minus y squared. So, z 
So that's exponential of one half natural log of squared of x squared minus y squared. The half is just on the log, it's not, wait, no, it's on the whole thing, isn't it? Yeah. Right. So then exponential of one half j inverse hyperbolic tangent y over x. So, this is, of course, the square root of the square root, right? Well, I mean, you bring the half inside, you get the square root of the square root. So we have, we could write this as, you know, um, I'll just write it as x squared minus y squared to the one-fourth, right? And then, how about this other piece? Well, that's hyperbolic tangent of y over x plus j cinch one half inverse hyperbolic tangent of y over x because um, e to the e to the j theta cosh theta plus j cinch theta. But here theta is one half inverse hyperbolic tangent of y over x. Still a ways away though. Uh -huh. Can't know you have a general equation now? Yeah, but of course what I have in the notes, that equation 128 is kind of nicer. Yeah. hyperbolic tangent in terms of the natural log and algebraic function to know what those formulas are. Because that's the kind of thing that you ought to know for a certain test. The inverse uh, no. The 
It's on the GRE. Could be. Oof. That's exactly the kind of nasty tricksy business that they like to just kind of spring on you guys. Um, I will look it up. So I've been editing my uh, Calculus One notes and um, I have it in there somewhere if I can find it. The inverse hyperbolic tangent of x is one half the log of one plus x over one minus x. Now there's strings attached to that, which hopefully, hopefully they apply to our current context. But you do need that the um, absolute value of x is less than one for this. suppose we're in that context. <clears throat> so if you have, you know, well maybe I should just look at it this way. I, I, I did I did I did this move down here, but in retrospect that was foolish. So because um, I should just do it up here, right? Exponential J over two. Uh, inverse hyperbolic tangent. Y over X, right? So why don't I just write that instead as J over 2, um, 1 half, right? Natural log of 1 plus Y over X over 1 minus Y over X, right? X plus Y over X minus Y, right? Yes. Or I could put the fourth power up here. Well, fine. Anyway, that, that is uh, exponential of J times the natural log of x plus y to the fourth power, one fourth power, minus the natural log of x minus y to the one fourth power. And So that is cosh of that log 
you can go back to the x plus y over x minus y, you're fine. The one fourth plus j cinch natural log of x plus y x minus y to the one fourth. Looks a little better. But then the thing is, this is one half e to the log of Pikmin plus e to the minus the log of Pikmin plus j over t e to the log of Pikmin minus e to the minus log of Pikmin. Pac-Man is x plus y over x minus y to the quarter power. And now those exponentials and logs can be, so that, that gives you one half of Pac-Man minus one over Pac-Man plus j over two Pac-Man minus one over Pac-Man. And then so like all together, you've got x squared minus y squared to the one quarter power, right? Which I'm going to rewrite as x minus y times x plus y to the one fourth power. That's this term. Mm -hmm. And that's equal to one half um, of, well, x back then was x plus y over x minus y to the quarter power and then minus, well this should be plus, plus 1 over that, so that's x minus y over x plus y to the quarter power plus j over 2 x plus y over x minus y to the quarter power minus x minus y over x plus y to the fourth power. See, like this cancels that. Yeah. This cancels that. That and that. So what you're left with is like this one x plus. So you get x plus y to the to the one half power. 